Thank you everyone for joining us on this Thursday evening. I appreciate you taking some time to spend with us and also appreciate Boulder Community Health for organizing this and putting on these lectures for the community. Just a brief outline of what we're gonna talk about tonight. So first, just gonna give an introduction, talk a little bit about how the eye works, describe what macular degeneration is, how is macular degeneration treated, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. A little bit about myself. My name is Justin Kanoff. I'm a medical and surgical retinal specialist, trained at the University of Pennsylvania for undergrad, University of Texas uh, for medical school, and then Harvard University for my residency and fellowship. I live in Longmont, Colorado. I'm a member of the comprehensive group, the Eye Care Center of Northern Colorado, and we diagnose, manage, and do medical and surgical of care of all eye diseases, including cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes, macular degeneration, LASIK and refractive surgery, dry eye management, and comprehensive eye exams. We have offices in Longmont, Boulder, and Lafayette, and we do all of our treatment at the Advanced Vision Surgery Center, which is our surgery center exclusively for eyes, with two state-of-the-art operating rooms and specially trained nurses and staff to help us treat eye diseases. So let's transition and talk a little bit about how the eye works before we get into the topic of macular degeneration. So we have here, hopefully everybody can see the cursor. This is an example of a normal eye and light enters through the front part of the eye and goes through the clear window called the cornea, and then through the pupil, which is the colored part of the eye. Light is then focused by the lens and then is focused on the retina, which then allows us to see. The lens helps us focus, and this is where a cataract develops over time. And then the light-sensitive tissue at the back part of the eye is called the retina. I like to think of the eye as a camera. I find it a useful analogy for understanding the different parts. So if we think of the cornea, this is the clear window at the front part of the eye that you look through. The lens is in the middle of the eye and that's what focuses light, just like a camera. And then the retina is in the back part of the eye and that's like the film in the camera which actually lets you see images. This information from the retina is then sent through the optic nerve, which functions like a cable, connecting the eye to the brain and then ultimately lets you see and form images. So we're gonna spend most of our time in this lecture talking about the retina, which again is that tissue in the back part of the eye that senses light. It lines the back of the eye like wallpaper, and this is what allows us to see and sends information to the brain. This photo here is a color image of the back of the eye showing a normal, healthy retina, with this yellow circle being the optic nerve, and then these red lines with blood vessels coming out from the optic nerve, and then bringing blood to, that, to the retinal tissue at the back part of the eye. The center area here is what we refer to as the macula, and this is where all of your high quality vision comes from and is also the part of the retina that has trouble and is diseased in macular degeneration. So let's transition and talk specifically about age-related macular degeneration. So macular degeneration is a leading cause of severe vision loss in people over the age of 65. And I think a little bit of a common misperception it is it's not a normal aging process of the eye. It's actually a disease that has a big impact on patients and can cause significant dysfunction. It's almost always in both eyes, but oftentimes patients are only aware of the symptoms in one eye. In this country, macular degeneration has a very high prevalence. At the age of 65, about 2.5% of patients, uh, people in this country will have macular degeneration going up to 6.5% by age 70, and by age 75, higher than 10% of, of uh, folks in the United States will have some form of macular degeneration. Sometimes it's very difficult to explain what patients see with macular degeneration, and we'll try to use some of these images to help explain what patients see. 
So if we look at this picture here, this is what normal vision would look like, seeing the dogs running through the grass. And often patients with macular degeneration will describe a black spot in the center of their vision, which makes it hard to see the center part. So who's at risk for macular degeneration and what can we do to try to mitigate that risk? Well, we divide the risk factors into two categories. There's some very well-established risk factors, and then there's some factors that we think have an effect on macular degeneration, but there's still ongoing research. So certainly age is a risk factor. Generally, people are going to be over the age of 60 for macular degeneration. Family history has a threefold increase in the risk of developing macular degeneration. Cigarette smoking or other tobacco use also dramatically increases your risk of macular degeneration. And then low dietary intake or concentrations of certain antioxidants and minerals and other supplements that we'll talk about later can increase your risk. So talking about that second category, possible risk factors, some studies have shown that macular degeneration is more common in women, but not all studies have, have borne that out. Also, some studies suggest patients with light-colored irises, cardiovascular disease, increased sun exposure, obesity, high cholesterol, hypertension. These all can, in some studies, show an increased risk of macular degeneration, but still more research needs to be done. So we commonly uh, get asked the question about macular degeneration and cataract surgery, and I think it's very important to educate people that cataract surgery in itself is not a risk factor for macular degeneration. So folks can feel comfortable having cataract surgery and that this is not going to affect their macular degeneration or increase their risk for it. And actually, quite the opposite. Cataract surgery is often extremely beneficial for patients with macular degeneration. Cataracts decrease contrast sensitivity, and to try to give an example of that, there's this chart over here on the right side of the slide, and essentially contrast is the difference in the color of what you're trying to look at in the foreground and the background of an image. So if you think of a black letter on a white background, that's going to be your highest contrast situation, and in most of life, that's not really how contrast is. Most things are gray and different shades of gray. And one of the things that cataracts affects first is it can affect your contrast sensitivity, just like macular degeneration. And those two things can compound to make it difficult for patients. And is, and is one reason why cataract surgery can be so beneficial for patients with macular degeneration. One caveat is that patients with macular degeneration should avoid the multifocal or other premium types of lenses that try to give distance and near vision because these lenses can decrease contrast sensitivity and could, could, could compound some of the difficulties with macular degeneration. One of the most common things that patients tell me as, as the macular degeneration advances, they can have trouble distinguishing faces. And you can see from this slide that as that spot in the center of the vision expands, it can make it very difficult to recognize faces or other images that you're trying to focus on. Another common symptom patients with macular degeneration experience is distortions in vision. And this can be seen a lot of different ways. Letters can appear distorted, lines of text can appear wavy. If you're in your home looking at tile on the floor or blinds on the windows, things that should have straight lines will appear curved or distorted. And another good way that we have patients monitor this is using what's called an Amsler grid, which you see on the right side of the screen. The center image is what the grid would look like normally with the lines nice and straight and right angles to each other, where on the right side of the screen you can see the lines bent and distorted, and that's what patients with macular degeneration can experience. So how do we diagnose macular degeneration? Well, the first and most important thing is to have is to have an eye exam. And we recommend that everybody have an eye exam at least once a year so we can pick up any type of eye diseases early before they cause significant trouble. There's many different techniques we use in the office to help diagnose and stage macular degeneration. We use what are called color photos of the back of the eye, as you can see in the top image. 
And this is an example of somebody who has an early form of dry macular degeneration with all of these yellow spots uh, being what we call drusen. We also take images that are much like x-rays of the eye called an OCT and it allows us to look at the layers of the retina in very high magnification and, and a lot of detail. The, the analogy of an x-ray is good, except that there is no radiation involved with this testing, so everybody can feel comfortable that it's not causing any issues. We also do what are called fluorescein angiograms, where we're able to see blood flowing through the blood vessels in the back of the eye, and then be able to see where is that blood leaking and help us detect macular degeneration. So there's two main types of macular degeneration. We divide it into what's called dry macular degeneration, or also called the atrophic form, and also into the wet form of macular degeneration, which is also called exudative or neovascular. And a sort of a simplified diagram is over to the right, and you can see on the left side we start with a normal retina, and then typically this will progress into an early form of dry macular degeneration where we typically start to see some of those yellow spots called drusen and other early signs. And then if the disease continues to progress, it can take one of two forms, turning into either the late stage of dry macular degeneration, which we call geographic atrophy, that has these large areas of thinning in the center part of the retina, or it can take another turn and, and turn into the wet form of, of uh, macular degeneration. Dry macular degeneration is certainly the most common form, and in this disease, the vision loss is gradual. What happens is over time, the retinal tissue in the back of the eye thins and atrophies, and once that happens, patients lose the ability for that retina to sense light and be able to translate that into images. And again, we have an example of a normal retina here on the left, and then a retina with macular degeneration, all of these yellow spots being drusen. We've talked about drusen a number of times, and drusen are these yellow spots that represent deposits that form underneath the retina and, uh, and help us diagnose it and is a, is a clue that macular degeneration is there. So we divide dry macular degeneration into the early form, the intermediate form and the late form of, of the disease. And as it progresses, patients experience more and more visual dysfunction. Ultimately, when it turns into the late form of the disease, this thinning develops in the center part of the eye, and that's where those central images are very difficult for patients to see. This is just another example of the late form of dry macular degeneration with that central thinning and atrophy of the retina. So a lot of times patients will ask us, well, what's, what's our risk of progressing? How do we know if we're going to get worse, and how do we see the future? Well, unfortunately, it's, it's impossible to completely see the future, but there's been a lot of studies done to help us stratify people into different risks. And there's a lot of information on this slide, but this is sort of a simplified form of the risk scale that we use, just assigning points in a one through uh, four value. And based on how many points the patients have, based on different findings in their eye, we can help predict the risk of progression. And you can see, depending if a patient has a score of, of zero, so no risk factors, they only have a half percent chance of progressing to a late form of the disease in five years, versus if somebody has four of these risk factors, they have up to a 50% chance of progressing to the late form of the disease within five years. And so this information is very helpful in counseling patients. So how do we treat dry macular degeneration? Well, at this point, there aren't, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of great treatments for the dry form of macular degeneration. So we do recommend vitamin supplementation, and there's been very large clinical trials done in the United States, which has really validated the usefulness of these supplements for helping prevent macular degeneration from progressing. There are a lot of different brands, and they're basically all labeled under the category of AREDS2. And as long as it says AREDS2 on the bottle or the box, that's how the patient knows that it has the correct formulation. 
and it's a combination of vitamins C and E, lutein, zeaxanthine, and then zinc and copper. And with these vitamins, it's been shown to reduce the risk of progression by up to 25% over the course of five years. And we, do, and we would recommend these in addition to a normal multivitamin that, that patients may take also. Now, a great question that patients ask, well, should everybody just be taking these eye, these eye vitamins to try to prevent macular degeneration? So unfortunately, the studies have not shown that the vitamins are helpful in preventing the onset of macular degeneration. It's really helpful in preventing progression of the disease once it starts. So really, the only people who need to be on these eye supplements are patients who have been diagnosed with macular degeneration. This is just another example of the supplements, but also a little bit of a cautionary slide. There's, there's many different types of supplements that talk about eye health and eye support and macular support. And really, the only vitamins or supplements that have been validated in large clinical trials are ones that are labeled with the AREDS2 designation. So how else can we reduce the risk of macular degeneration and progression of the disease? Well, there's good evidence that a, that a healthy diet, like the Mediterranean diet with green leafy vegetables can help prevent progression of the disease. And the biggest risk factor that we can modify is avoiding tobacco products. If you recall from that slide where we were talking about the risk factors of macular degeneration, we talked about age, we talked about family history, and those are things that we can't, we can't modify. But the big thing on there that we can modify is tobacco use, and that can help decrease the risk of onset of macular degeneration and progression of macular degeneration. So how do we monitor the dry form? Well, we briefly talked about this Amsler grid, and it, it looks like graph paper. And what it's useful for is helping patients at home monitor if there are any changes in their vision which might suggest that the disease has progressed into the wet form. So this is an example of what the Amsler grid looks like normally. And then this is an example of what it may look like for a patient who's experiencing either a progression of their dry macular degeneration or a transition to the wet form. There's also home monitoring devices that have recently come on the market. There's a company called 4C Home which has a tabletop device where the patient would look in with each eye individually, and then using a mouse and an interactive computer would take a daily test, which then through different algorithms will help predict if the disease is progressing or if there's risk for the wet form. If the machine or the computer detects what they call a signal or an event, then both the patient and the patient's doctor are notified which would then allow that patient to come in and get, and get an eye exam to determine if a change has really happened. Just to jump back one slide, and really this home monitoring is so critical uh, with the Amsler or other devices because we wanna know about a transition to wet macular degeneration as soon as possible because the wet form is highly treatable as we'll talk about later. The other, other ways we can help patients with the, with the dry form of macular degeneration is through low vision specialists. Low vision aids such as a magnifier, a telescope, a closed caption television, visual rehabilitation, or, dis, or different adaptive technology can really help patients maximize the vision that they have. These are just examples of a few different devices with a handheld magnifier or a tabletop video magnifier or different telescopic devices. It's really all about maximizing the vision and the vision that the patients have. So where, where do we go in the future and how do we get better treatment for, for the dry form of macular degeneration? Well, there are multiple drugs in clinical trials, both in early and late stages, and they take many forms from eye drops to oral pills to eye injections to different surgical treatment. And probably one of the most cutting edge and exciting is different types of stem cell tran uh, transplants. There's been some good data that we can transplant what are called RPE cells, which are cells that live underneath the retina and have trouble in macular degeneration. And if we're able to grow new layers of, these, of this tissue in a lab and transplant that into the eye, this can restore function. 
uh, in some patients in early clinical trials. But it's important to here to highlight some of the dangers of un unregulated trials and clinics. A lot of clinics on the internet or around will talk about stem cells and stem cell transplants really without any of the clinical or safety data to back this up. And patients need to just be very careful about enrolling in clinical trials or getting treatments uh, from an untrusted source. So let's transition and talk about wet macular degeneration. So wet macular degeneration is the, is the less common form. It's about 10% of patients with macular degeneration will have the wet form. It's caused by an abnormal growth of blood vessels underneath the retina. So if you imagine the retina lining the back of the eye like wallpaper, underneath that wallpaper, this collection of blood vessels grow that shouldn't be there. And these blood vessels don't form correctly and they have very leaky and, and poor support structures. And over time, they leak blood and they leak fluid, which then leads to loss of central vision. So again, about 10% of patients with macular degeneration will have the wet form, and about 35% of people with wet macular degeneration in one eye will get the wet macular degeneration in the other eye. And this photo over to the right is an, sorry, this photo over to the right is an example of the wet form of the disease. And in the center part of the retina, we're looking at this area of bleeding and this area of elevation, which represents the abnormal blood vessels, which, are, which is causing trouble for this patient. So what are the symptoms of wet macular degeneration? Some, in some ways, they're not, they're not entirely distinct from the dry form. Patients can see new distortions, lines are wavy or distorted, or just areas in the vision that are difficult to see. So this is an example of the OCT that we talked about earlier, which is like the x-ray of the retina that lets us see all of the layers. If we look on the right side of the screen, this is a normal healthy retina, and you can see all of the different layers throughout the retina and this normal dip in the center, and this is what healthy tissue should look like. When we come over to the left side of the screen, there's this large bump and mountain in the middle, and this is where that collection of abnormal blood vessels is growing underneath the retina. And then this black space off to the side represents the fluid and the blood that's leaking out of these blood vessels and causing trouble for the patient to see. So how do we treat wet macular degeneration? Well, it's a, it's a long story that's progressed over the course of about 30 years and started with treatments that really were not very satisfactory and luckily today have progressed to treatments that are fantastic. So early in the treatment of wet macular degeneration, laser therapy was used to essentially burn or cauterize the blood vessels. As you can imagine, burning or cauterizing blood vessels underneath the retina can cause tremendous damage to the retina itself. And so this treatment is not used anymore because we have much, much better therapies. Next in the story came what is called photodynamic therapy, or PDT, which instead of a hot laser is a cold laser, which activates medicine that's circulating in the body. So this medicine is injected through an IV, it circulates to the back of the eye, and then this cold laser is able to activate that medicine just in the area of the abnormal blood vessels and, and cause those to regress. So this was a tremendous advancement because it was able to treat the abnormal blood vessels without damaging the healthy retinal tissue overlying it. But really, folks were not satisfied because the best that this treatment could do was really slow down the progression of wet macular degeneration. It wasn't able to stop it and it certainly wasn't able to reverse it. So our current treatments are far, far superior, and what the mainstay of our treatments are are the eye injections. They're injections of what we call anti-VEGF. And what these are are medications that block the signals which allow the blood vessels underneath the retina to grow. And by blocking these signals, the, the blood vessels no longer have their support and their signals needed to grow, and then it causes them to regress and stop leaking. And these, with these treatments over the long term, there's a 95% chance of patients maintaining their vision, 
and there's a 30 to 40 percent chance of having a, a significant improvement in the vision, which we talk about as, as gaining more than three lines on the eye chart. And this is really a game changer in the treatment of wet macular degeneration and has really been a miracle for patients. The four, the four medicines that are, that are currently available are Avastin, Lucentis, Ilea, and Bayoview, and we'll talk a little more about the options later. But essentially, using a syringe, the medicine is injected into the center part of the eye, which then allows it to come in contact with the abnormal blood vessels, which then causes them to regress and stop leaking. Another option for the treatment of wet macular degeneration in very selected cases is surgery. Sometimes as these blood vessels grow, they can cause what we call massive hemorrhages or massive bleeding underneath the retina. And the blood underneath the retina is very toxic to the retina, and so the thought is with this surgery, we can use a combination of different medicines and gas bubbles to essentially push the blood out from underneath the retina and have it act almost like a squeegee that would on a window and move that blood away from the center before it has a chance to have the toxic effect. And so this is really reserved for very extreme and very aggressive cases of macular degeneration where surgical treatment would be an option. So again, the mainstay of treatment are injections and patients often have a lot of questions surrounding injections which medication should be started, how often will I need the medications, how long, will I need the, how long will I need the medications, and will the injection hurt? So which medication should be used? Obviously, it's a very complex uh, decision-making process to decide which medicine to start. So there's four current, current available options. The first one is called Avastin, which was originally FDA approved for the treatment of colon cancer, but it was later discovered that it could actually treat these abnormal blood vessels in the back of the eye. There's over 15 years of very high quality clinical data to support its use in eye conditions and also its safety in treating eye condition. And most of the time, for a, for a significant number of patients, it'll be equivalent to the much more expensive medications we'll talk about below, and it's around $80 a dose. So for, for many patients, this is the medicine that makes sense to start with. Other options include Lucentis and Ilea, with her, which are both FDA approved specifically for the treatment of, of wet macular degeneration. But as you can see, there's a very large difference in cost, with costing between $1,600 and $2,000 a dose. Now there are some patients who these medicines may work better. And so in selected cases, they, they can certainly be an optimal choice. The fourth medicine, Bayoview, was recently FDA approved. But unfortunately, when it was started to be used in widespread clinical use, there were issues with eye inflammation. And so the vast majority of retina specialists, except for very select cases, are not currently using Bayoview. So how often am I going to need the injections, and how long will I need the injections for? Well, at the beginning, those are both very difficult questions to answer. So typically, treatments will be started with monthly injections, where we'll inject every 28 to 30 days, and then do a reevaluation and see how the response is. Patients are typically examined at each appointment and to determine if they've had a good response or a suboptimal response to the medication. If a poor response happens, then at that point we would uh, consider switching to a different medication. So then the question is, well, how long are, am I going to need these injections for? And that's the difficult question to answer at the beginning. Some people will, will need injections every month for years. Some people will need a few injections, and there's a lot of people in between. After we see a good response, which we would like to see all the blood and the fluid disappear, then we'll, then we'll switch to a strategy to try to minimize injections for patients. And we can either treat with what we call an as-needed approach, where we would examine patients at each office visit and then see if the disease is active and if treatment is needed. Or we can use what's called a treat and extend approach, where we would treat at each visit, but then try to extend the interval between visits 
to as long as possible with, with the disease remaining inactive. Both of the strategies have, have merit and it's really individualized for, for each individual patient. Another very important question is, will it hurt? And I think that's one of the first things people, people think of when we talk about eye injections. And really, for over 95% of my patients, the injections can be done with only the minimalist of, of discomfort. Most patients typically just feel a pressure sensation on their eye, and the eye will be irritated or so for 24 hours. But for the vast, vast majority of patients, it is, it is a very, very minimal discomfort. And so I just like to highlight that because it really shouldn't be a barrier to receiving what I think a lot of people would call a miracle treatment for this eye disease. There's many different types of anesthesia we can use, and for almost everybody, we can make it comfortable. So what are the future treatments for wet macular degeneration? So one of the future treatments, which was recently FDA approved about, about four weeks ago, is what's called the port delivery system. And what this is, you can see in this picture to the right, is essentially it's a little device which is implanted in the wall of the eye, which essentially serves as a reservoir for medication. So instead of having the injections every month, this device can be implanted and filled once every six months or once a year, and then the medicine is slowly delivered to the eye over time. It is, a surgical, it is a surgical procedure that requires implantation, but then the refills are done in the clinic. Other future treatments include medications by mouth or eye drops that are in, that are in clinical trials. Multiple new injections are in clinical trials, and a good question might be, well, there's already three different injections. Why do we need more, why do we need more injections to treat wet macular degeneration? Well, as great as the treatments are, and really as much of a miracle as they are, there still are some drawbacks. And really what we're looking for is longer lasting medications, which will lead to less treatment burden on the patients. Could we get the same effect by injecting once every two months, once every three months, or once every four months as we do with our current medication. These, diff these new medications have different targets and they're different combination drugs. And the most, uh, the most likely one that'll receive FDA approval this year is a medicine called furisimab, which hopefully will allow us to lengthen out the injections between that patients, uh, lengthen out the intervals that patients have with their injections. But we'll have to stay tuned and see how that does in clinical practice. Other future treatments are what are called gene therapy. So essentially, what this therapy does is it turns the eye itself into a factory which is able to make its own medication. So the, so the information, and everybody now we, with, the, with the COVID vaccines have heard of messenger RNA and different types of DNA. The instructions essentially to make these different medications can be implanted inside the eye and then the cells inside the eye turn into mini factories, which, which will then produce its own medicine over time. This is certainly something that's a little further ahead in the future, but there are early clinical trials going on right now with this type of approach. A couple clinical trials to highlight at the Eye Care Center of Northern Colorado we, we, we have what's called the Advanced Vision Research Institute, and we're the only ophthalmic research department in Boulder County. And what we're trying to do is bring some of these new and advanced treatments to patients earlier. So currently, we have three different trials going on for macular degeneration. We have the, our Unity trial, the Opthea trial, and the Alexion trial. The Unity trial for wet macular degeneration is, is looking at patients who currently have active disease and are currently active be, actively being treated with these injections, but maybe are not having a, a great response. Either we can't get the fluid to go away, or patients are stuck at every four weeks and we're unable to lengthen out the time uh, of the injections because the disease simply reactivates. And what this trial is looking at is looking at a medication to try to encourage the disease cells in the back of the eye to progress through their natural de cell death process. And the thought is if we can encourage the cells that are dysfunctional and not working properly, 
and naturally go through the cell death process, that'll leave room for healthier cells and normal cells to regrow in their place. The Opthea trial is a, is a trial for patients with the new, new onset of wet macular degeneration who have never been treated before. And what we're looking at is we're testing to see if a second medication, in addition to the FDA approved ones we've discussed, can help patients have a better response or what we call a more durable response, meaning that patients are able to go longer in between the injections. Maybe instead of going four or six weeks in between injections, they're able to go eight or 10 weeks or 12 weeks in between injections. And essentially what the medication is looking at is we, we briefly talked about VEGF earlier in the talk, which is that signal that's signaling these abnormal blood vessels to grow. And what this new medication does is, is more completely block the different forms of that signal. And the thought is, if we're able to turn off all of the forms of the signal instead of perhaps just two of the forms of the signal, we might get a better response. The last trial, which is very exciting for patients, is, for, is a trial for dry macular degeneration for which there really are no great treatments. And what this is, is this is a pill taken by mouth to decrease inflammation. One of the new understandings of the dry form of macular degeneration over the last few years is it seems there's a large inflammatory component uh, involved in the progression of dry macular degeneration. And the thought is if we're able to intervene and decrease the inflammation inside the eye, we could perhaps decrease the progression of macular degeneration and try to stop that thinning which occurs and which is so devastating to patients. So, that, so that's our, our run through of wet and dry macular degeneration. What are the current treatments? What are the future treatments? Where have we been and where are we going? I hope everybody found this very informative and, and interesting and I look forward to spending some more time with you this evening to, to take questions. Thank you. Doctor, thank you so much. That was a very informative um, lecture. We do have uh, quite a few questions here, though, so Excellent. I'm just going to start going at it. And um, we'll start here. Are yellow lesions in the choroid layer under the macula related to macular degeneration? So that's a great question. So. There's a lot of different type of these yellow lesions that we can see in the back part of the eye. Typically, lesions in the choroid are gonna be related to different forms of retinal disease. The yellow lesions in macular degeneration are typically underneath the retina, sort of in between the retina and the choroid. If you think of the eye like an onion, there's a lot of layers in the back part of the eye, and these particular drusen form in between those layers and what we typically see with macular degeneration. Does a macular hole mean AMD? That's a great question. So a macular hole is, is different than macular degeneration. So a macular hole is when, there a, when a hole develops in the central part of the retina and it can actually create symptoms that are very similar to macular degeneration. Patients can often see distortions or they can actually have a missing spot in the center of their vision. However, the macular hole is a much more mechanical problem with the eye with essentially some of the tissue inside the eye is pulling the layers apart and a hole develops. And the treatment for a macular hole is, is a surgical treatment and actually has upwards of 92 or 93% success, so very, very well treated. So different than macular degeneration, but can be similar symptoms. So all the more reason it's important to, if you have symptoms to see an eye doctor so they can help differentiate the issue. Okay. Um, how do you find trusted sources for these trials? So that, that's a great question. So there are, there are tons of different trials on the internet and um, sometimes it can be really confusing to find trusted sources. So for example, there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov, which sounds like any trial listed on there would be a reputable trial. However, the government that runs the website is not, is not actually evaluating any of the trials. So 
I think the general safe thing is you have to be very leery of any information you read on the internet. And instead, I would, I would uh, stick with trusted sources like your ophthalmologist, your retina specialist, your, your primary care provider, um, who you really know and can really help you critically evaluate um, sources. Another good source is, is typically if a research trial is, is sponsored by a large university, those are typically going to be very well-designed, robust trials that you know, have very good oversight. But I think when in doubt, it's better to stick with your local physician and let them guide you through the process. Great. Thank you. Can you talk to uh, any new medications that slow the growth of geographic atrophy regions? regions? So that's a good question. And unfortunately, there aren't any approved medicines right now that, sh that slow the progression of geographic atrophy. The closest we came was about two years ago. There was a medicine that was in late stage of clinical trials. And unfortunately, in, in the last big clinical trial that the company was conducting before it went to the FDA, it ended up appearing to not, to not have any benefits for patients. So, at this point, we don't have any approved medications that are able to either stop or slow down the progression of the geographic atrophy. The, the eye vitamins we talked about can, can help prevent the onset of the geographic atrophy, um, but we're still waiting for those medications, and that's why we're actively involved in clinical trials, and everyone around the country is working on clinical trials to try to figure out a, med a medicine for this huge unmet need. It's good that that research is going on. Yeah, it's, it's exciting, yeah. What is the difference between macular degeneration and myopic uh, degeneration? So great question. So the end result of those two processes is often very similar. So both, both age-related macular degeneration and myopic degeneration can lead to thinning of the retina, loss of vision, and they both can actually have these abnormal blood vessels grow underneath the retina. The difference is, is the genesis of the process. With age-related macular degeneration, we don't, still don't fully understand where the process begins. Whereas in myopic degeneration, it happens in people who are very nearsighted. So when, when somebody is very nearsighted with a prescription of minus seven or higher, the tissue in the back part of the eye is extremely thin. And one of the layers in the back part of the eye functions to help keep blood vessels where they're supposed to be. And essentially, as this tissue gets thinner and thinner, the blood vessels are able to break through and cause trouble. And it's important to remember that even somebody who's not nearsighted anymore after cataract surgery, from your eye's standpoint and from the tissue, it still, it still behaves as, as if you are, are nearsighted. And so that's the difference. Myopic degeneration happens in eyes that have a, are very, very nearsighted, and the age-related macular degeneration happens more from age and from the inflammation in those yellow drusen we see. So several people are asking, what about dry macular degeneration? Any treatments, any progress, any uh, more current information on that. Yeah, so, so similar to the geographic atrophy form, so, so dry macular degeneration at this point, really our treatment is focused on two things. One is encouraging the use of the vitamin supplementation because that's been shown to reduce the progression of the dry form. Uh, encouraging to stop smoking because that can also help reduce progression of the dry form. And I guess a third thing, really three things, is that and then also monitoring for changing to the wet form because at this point we really don't have great treatments specifically designed for the dry form of macular degeneration. And since, and since about 90% of patients have that form of the disease, there's really a lot of research and innovation um, and time being spent on developing treatments, but unfortunately we still don't have great treatments for the dry form. As far as the vitamins, um, I believe that you said that you, uh, they don't prevent this. Mm -hmm. um, is there any research going on to that? Like, could you start in your 40s and start taking zinc and C and E and that really hold this off? Yeah, so great question. So 
In the original very large trials that were conducted to see if these vitamins worked for, for preventing the progression, they also looked at groups of people in that same study who were younger and didn't have macular degeneration. And what the study found is that the patients who already had macular degeneration, it did reduce their risk of, of progressing and having worsening of disease. However, the patients in the study who didn't have macular degeneration yet, it didn't show a benefit in preventing the onset. So, so, the best, so the best of our knowledge now, there really wouldn't be any benefit for patients you know, in their 40s or of any age of taking those vitamins without, um, who, who don't have macular degeneration. And you know, in a similar vein, there's been, there's been a lot of genetic testing that started to be sort of offered on the internet and through other sources that, that try to predict your risk of, of having macular degeneration or your risk of progressing. And while some of those tests can actually be relatively accurate in, in predicting your risk, the hard thing is we don't have anything to offer patients. If you take one of those genetic tests and it comes back and says, I'm at higher risk of progressing to macular degeneration, we don't have any treatments really that we can, that we can recommend. And really, well, all that we, we would recommend would be stopping smoking, having a heart healthy diet, and then also having regular eye exams uh, with, your, with your eye provider. Okay, that's a little frustrating, um, but uh, I guess it is what it is, you know, as yeah. far as dealing with it once um, there is the onset of it. Well, I think that's really where I think that's really where we want to progress, and where we, really where a lot of medicine is progressing into this sort of era we call personalized medicine, where we would be able to do a genetic test and look at your specific genetic makeup, your specific your specific genetic profile, and then based on that, say, well, you should do these interventions to help prevent the disease, and if the disease happens, medicine A is better for you, whereas maybe for somebody else medicine B, and there, there are a lot of studies and trials going on to try to use that genetic information to help us predict risk of macular degeneration, who's going to progress, who might respond better to one medicine or the other, and so I think really that era of personalized medicine based on everybody's individual genetic code is where we would like to head towards. So we're all such a computer-based uh, society here. Uh, does staring at uh, computer screens for long periods of time cause deterioration of the retina and uh, maculation? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So while there can be certain, while there can be a lot of problems with staring at screens, trouble sleeping, dry eyes, maybe not spending enough time with family, a lot of different things. Luckily, macular degeneration is not one of them. So, you know, the screens do put out some blue light, but. But the blue light that the screens put out is not of a wavelength that's able to damage the eye. So there really hasn't been any good connection between screen use or blue light and, and macular degeneration. So while there may be other good reasons to put the screen down and do other things, no worries about macular degeneration, though. Um, I believe that you said that uh, AMD could stabilize, so basically stop uh, progressing. Um, can you talk to that again a little bit? Yes, there's a very wide range of how quickly macular degeneration will progress, and really for a lot of patients with the dry form of macular degeneration, it'll never progress beyond what we call the intermediate stage, which essentially is we can see a lot of different color changes in the back of the eye. We can see the disease on the pictures. There may be some minimal difficulty, a little bit of trouble with contrast, maybe a little bit of trouble with very small letters, but for a lot of patients, it'll stop at that stage and not necessarily ever progress to the late form. And to answer that question, if we, I'll just sort of go back through these slides real quick. If we look if we, if we look at this chart here, this is sort of, this is sort of what the, that question is getting at, that there can be a very wide range of only a half percent of people having progression of the macular degeneration over five years to some people with certain risk factors having 50% risk. So for a lot of people, this disease may never progress and hopefully will never cause them trouble. The hard part and why it's still so important to monitor it and to get regular eye exams is we still don't have a perfect crystal ball to know 
who's going to progress and who's not going to progress. But there are, there are a lot of people who will get diagnosed with the disease but are not going to have the significant trouble that we've talked about. Okay. That's kind of reassuring. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what anesthesia is used to prevent uh, injection pain? So there's, so there's a very wide range, and that's why I can say pretty confidently that, that we're able to get almost everybody comfortable. So the most minimal form of anesthesia we use is just topical drops. We just put a few drops in the eye of a numbing medicine, and for a lot of people, that's enough to make it completely comfortable. For some people who need a little more, we can use a gel medication that sits on the surface of the eye, and then we can also use cotton swabs that are soaked in numbing medicine. And then for some people who really have, who are having the most trouble, we actually give a little supplemental numbing injection, which then will actually make the num main injection not hurt. But for most people, they fall into that first, those first couple categories of just those topical medications that we're able to keep the eye nice and comfortable. Is there any connection between AMD and VMT? Uh, so that's a good question. So VMT stands for vitreomacular traction. And VMT is actually much more along the lines of the macular hole that was talked about earlier. So it, it's a mechanical process where the gel that fills the inside of the eye actually mechanically pulls on the retina and can cause the layers to split and again can cause very similar symptoms of distortion or blind spots. But again, just like macular holes, that's treated surgically and, and, is, and is a very different process than macular degeneration, but can have very similar symptoms. Can you talk about floaters? If you have those, does it mean that uh, you're starting macular degeneration, you'll be getting macular degeneration? Yeah, so floaters is also a distinct uh, entity from macular degeneration. So macular degeneration, as we talked about, is a process of, of the retina, of that retinal tissue that lines the back of the eye like wallpaper. Floaters come from the center part of the eye. So if you think of your eye like a basketball, the center part of your eye is filled with this gel-like material called the vitreous. And when you're born, it's a very solid, uniform consistency. And then as a normal aging process that happens to everybody, that gel turns into a liquid. And then those little pockets of fluid and little pockets of protein start moving around inside the gel. And that's where floaters come from. Now, if you ever all of a sudden have a new onset of floaters, you want to get to an eye doctor right away because that can be a sign of a retinal tear or a retinal detachment. Um, and that's something that we would want to treat right away. But, you know, it, but it doesn't uh, give you an increased risk of having macular degeneration. So again, a symptom that we want to take very seriously and we want to look at right away, but, but different than macular degeneration. Okay, good to know. Um, are, are any trials being done out of state like Unity, yeah, Unity or Florida? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, you know, so these trials are being done, um, you know, in, in, retinal in retinal clinics and all 50 states across the country. Now, different, you know, different clinics are going to have a different set of trials because a particular, a particular drug company is not going to need 200 different sites for their particular clinical trial. So, you know, different, different sites will have different clinical trials available, but, you know, really there should be trials available in every, in every state around the country for, pe for patients who are, who are interested. Is there a risk to taking... Uh, is it called ARED mm -hmm. to, uh, even if not proven to help, if a person is over 65 and has a strong family history of macular degeneration? Well, so while I don't, I don't, think, there, I don't think there's a risk to taking it, I mean, certainly there's, there's no evidence that the, that the vitamins are going to cause um, any detrimental effect. Um, but again, I don't think there's also isn't any evidence that that taking the vitamins is going to help is going to help prevent the onset of the disease. So, while I don't, while there isn't a risk we know of, I still wouldn't recommend it just because the data doesn't support it. You know, and in terms of the risk of AREDS, so you know, we're discussing what's called the AREDS two, which would suggest there was an AREDS one, and so the AREDS one vitamin uh, was changed because there was a concern the original vitamin had had beta carotene in it. 
And there's a concern that, that taking supplements of beta carotene in people who are smokers or former smokers can increase the risk of lung cancer. And so with that risk in mind, the formulation was changed and the beta carotene was removed. And that's when the zeaxanthine and the lutein were added instead. And so as far as, as, far as the data suggests at this point, there really isn't any risk that we know of from the AREDS uh, two vitamins. But again, you know, I, I would want to follow the, the clinical data, and there really just isn't good data to support it being used as a preventative medicine. So living in Colorado, we're, we're pretty close to the sun here. Mm -hmm. So would wearing sunglasses uh, be a preventative? And also, if you've had a prior sunburn to your eyes, hmm. uh, is there a risk? So, you know, I do think sunglasses, especially in Colorado, are a good, are a good preventative and a good use for general eye health. You know, there is, there is a good suggestion that UV light is a risk factor for progression of cataracts, for progression of macular degeneration and, and other ocular diseases. And especially living in Colorado, I do think it's smart to wear a good pair of UV sunglasses to help, to help prevent that. In terms of um, the sunburn to the eye, um, while it certainly can cause a lot of issues, uh, that's usually not going to increase the risk of macular degeneration. Um, it can certainly cause other issues, but um, I, I wouldn't think that would make macular degeneration specifically more of a risk. But I do think in Colorado, it is good to use a good pair of UV blocking glasses when you're outside. Okay. Um, progressives. Um, should you stop wearing progressives or wait till you have macular degeneration show up and then address that issue? Uh, what do you do with progressives? So progressive lenses, uh, a little separate than macular degeneration. I don't think necessarily, the progressive certainly won't necessarily have an impact on macular degeneration. Um, one thing I found is that, you know, when we talk about progressive lenses versus bifocals, you're, you're talking about glasses that are used both for distance vision and then also for reading vision up close. And there's two different ways to accomplish that. One is you can accomplish it with bifocals, where there would be essentially one lens on the top, one lens on the bottom. Or you can accomplish it with progressives, where there's a smooth transition between the two. And the thing with the progressives is you tend to have to hold your head and really hold your eye in a specific position. And I think as patients start to develop macular degeneration, it can be, a, it can be more difficult to find that sort of, quote, sweet spot with the progressives. And so I found that patients with macular degeneration will often do better with bifocals um, than progressive lenses just because of that sort of ease of getting the right, the right magnification. But, but certainly progressives are not going to make macular degeneration worse or in any, any way deteriorate your eye health if, if that's working for you. Does Medicare cover this and possibly the trials as well? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that? Uh, does Medicare oh. cover treatment um, as well as any of the trials? So that's a great question. So, so luckily, Medicare and the Medicare Advantage plans and the private insurance companies, they do cover, all of them do cover the treatments for macular degeneration. Um, some of the carriers will sort of mandate that we start with like Avastin before moving to the more expensive medicines, but all of the insurance companies will cover, will cover the treatment of macular degeneration. In terms of the clinical trials, the interesting thing is it's actually the drug companies or, or the device companies who are sponsoring the trials, they actually completely pay for, for all study expenses. So the exams, the visit, the medication, the device, um, you know, uh, travel expenses, everything like that is paid for by the sponsoring companies, though actually none of it goes, goes through your insurance. And so that's a nice thing is that you know, insurance is never going to be a barrier to participating in a clinical trial because, because the companies cover all those costs. Should a person with family history of AMD have eye exams by an optometrist or ophthalmologist? So that's a great question. And I think really, I think really the, the, the key thing is really going to a provider who you trust and a provider who 
um, who is able to give good care. And, and you can certainly find op both optometrists and ophthalmologists and retina specialists who can all provide great eye exams for you and can really do a good um, comprehensive exam. And I think as long as you trust your provider and, and are confident in their exams, then they should be able to pick up any of the signs of macular degeneration and then, if needed, refer you on to a, to a retina specialist for more spe uh, special treatment. What about LASIK? What if you've had it? Uh, what um, if you're starting to get older, should you uh, have LASIK or not? Yeah, so luckily, so, so luckily LASIK or any other type of uh, surgery like that doesn't affect your risk of macular degeneration, which is good. Um, you know, LASIK or other type of refractive surgery um, can sometimes make the calculations with cataract surgery a little more challenging, so that's something to consider. And typically, the LASIK and refractive surgery is going to, be, going to be reserved for a younger population of patients. As you start getting a little older and you start getting closer to the age of needing cataract surgery, cataract surgery can achieve that same goal of, of getting rid of your prescription. So if somebody's close to needing cataract surgery, it wouldn't really make sense to do LASIK or refractive surgery. And so that's typically done for, for younger patients who are not quite uh, near that cataract age. Okay. A um, couple more questions here, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, do you see any change in status of treatment for IJT, which is idiopathic oh. juxtafovial teleangiectasis? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, J yeah, yeah, JXT, yeah. So, so what, what that uh, question is referring to is it's, um, it's very interesting. There was actually, um, historically, there was a large number of diseases that were lumped together and called macular degeneration because really we just didn't have the technology or the expertise to really start differentiating the diseases. And JXT or what we call MACTEL is one of those diseases that for a long time was just lumped together with macular degeneration. And as we had better imaging, we begun to understand that the, that the Max, MACTEL is more of a, it's a different problem with the blood vessels. And so typically it has a much better prognosis than age-related macular degeneration, although it can have very similar features where those patients can need injections. So in some ways it's uh, you know, similar, but you know, as we understand more about it, it's different. And there are actually some good clinical trials going on to try to look at that specific disease, better classify it, and better understand it. And so that, that person may, might be able to look for it under what's called MACTEL, which is M-A-C-T-E-L. Um, and that would be a way to sort of find more information about that. Okay. If you progress from dry to wet, do you need to keep taking our reds too? Yeah, so I do, I do suggest the patient still, still continue to take the AREDS2 uh, really for two reasons. One, it may be that the person is only transitioned to the wet form of the disease in one eye, so there still is a second eye that just has an earlier form of the dry. And in that case, we still want to use the, the AREDS2 vitamins to try to decrease the risk of that second eye progressing. In patients who have already transitioned to wet in both eyes, it's really a little bit of an unanswered clinical question, and I think it falls into sort of the risk-benefit, uh, you know, weighing. And that, even though maybe there's not great data to suggest um, how helpful it is, I also don't think there's data to suggest that it's harmful. So in that case, I err on the side of suggesting that patients continue to take the AREDS too, even if both eyes already have the wet form. Well, it looks like our, our time is close, closed up. I just really wanted to thank everybody for joining us and really wanted to thank Boulder Community for inviting me to speak and giving me this opportunity to share some information with, with everybody at home. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream you will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. 
Again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.